And I hand over to Professor Branch now for a, I think, very exciting and knowledgeable morning this morning. I'm happy to have you here. I'm happy to be here myself. And now it's to you, Professor Branch, to keep me happy this morning. I'll do my best to keep Thank all you. of you happy. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just waiting for my talk to come up on the screen here. But while I'm waiting, I want to share some secrets with you. But you've got to promise, cross your heart and promise to die if you ever, ever, ever pass these secrets on. <laughs> the first secret is not such a secret. It's the fact that I really, really love teaching teachers. I owe my entire career to a particular teacher at my school. When I was doing A-levels, the teacher that was teaching us physical science, as it was called in those days, physics and chemistry, was appointed as an inspector, which is obviously a very big step up in his own personal career. And the only trouble was they failed to get a replacement for him to teach us. And so for a year, which was a two-year A-level curriculum, for a year, we had no teacher. And then this particular teacher, who incidentally was absolutely brilliant, heard of this, and he resigned from the inspectorate. He came back to the school, and he said to us, I've got one year to teach you everything you need to know normally in two years. I promise you, if you don't learn as fast as I want you to learn, I'll beat the hell out of you. Those, <laughs> those were the old days. And he taught us, and I passed with distinction. But the story doesn't end there. This is the really secret part, because I was doing I was doing maths and English and biology and physical science and I had to pass three of them to get my A-levels. And now there's a terrible truth I want to share with you all. And that is, I failed biology. <laughs> Can you believe it? <laughs> so, those are the secrets I wanted to share with you. But there is another secret I want to share with you. I am to this very day still intensely nervous before I give a talk like this. And I wanted to share it with you. A, because I think it's actually a good thing. And B, because I know a lot of you, when you have to give your talks, you also are nervous. And my own uh, student, when I told her this, she said, oh, I'm so glad you told me. <laughs> so there we are. Just before I kick off, thank you, forward, backward, got it. Just before I kick off formally with the talk, I just wanted to mention that you people are very kindly being given copies of Two Oceans, courtesy of Kift. But Marco and I have written uh, another book as well, it's Living Shores. And this does a completely different thing. <coughs> what it does is it goes through the ecosystems and then it goes through all of the main problems that are facing our ecosystems and how we resolve them. Fisheries, management, climate change and so on. So just bear in mind this book when you are looking for information to back up your talks. I'll leave it out here and people feel free to, to browse on it. Now, let me begin. You'll notice, first of all, that this is very specifically not George Branch's talk. This is George and Margot Branch's talk. I've been privileged to have Margot as my soulmate all my life and the most wonderful, wonderful time we've had together. I'd like to try and cover four different aspects in this talk. The first is an introduction to the oceanography and its effects 
on both land and sea. This is very much part of the, your own curricula that you will be teaching. Secondly, you, this afternoon you will be going to the Two Oceans Aquarium to continue the session there. And I wanted to give you a little bit of a feeling of the background that's going on in Aquaria to help with research. Thirdly, I want to talk about the fact that our environment is changing. And again, this is something very much embedded in your, your curriculum. And then lastly, I want you to take you to some of my own research. And that is, I became fascinated with the fact that a lot of effort goes into managing particular species like lobsters or pilchard or whatever. But very little research at that stage was being put into asking the question, how important are these species in the ecosystem? What kind of effects do they have on the ecosystem? So let's start with the first of these topics, that's the oceanography. And you'll all be aware with, of the fact that Southern Africa is unique in the world in having a southern boundary separating two major currents. The Agullis on the one side and the Benguela on the other. Are these lights too bright for you guys to see here? Is it okay? You can read them okay. Thank you. So I'd like to just uh, skim through. Remind me which is the pointer on this. Is it the red button? Uh, yeah. That red button. Area. Great. I'd like to remind you that there are huge contrasts between these two currents. Greater contrasts than anywhere else in the world. First of all, in the temperatures, uh, <coughs> averaging somewhere around about 24 degrees C on the east coast, but somewhere around about 12 degrees on the west. The speed of the currents is totally different. The Agullis is one of the most enormous and rapid currents in the world. The Benguela is a lazy, sluggardly thing that just ekes its way slowly up the west coast. But what you do have on the west coast is huge amounts of nutrients in the water compared to the east coast. And the first of the consequences that we have on land is that the warm current is releasing huge amounts of rainfall on the east coast compared with the desert-like conditions on the west coast. So let's just pursue those a little bit more. The Agullis is quite a complicated current because it swings down along the east coast and then you will notice how it swings away from the coast here and then most of it retroflects back here and goes into a huge circulation that goes right around the Indian Ocean and returns eventually to the same gyre there. But relatively recently it's been discovered that some of the Agullis <coughs> doesn't do that. Some of the Agullis peels off as rings which shift their way all the way up here right up to the east coast of America where the Gulf Stream exists. And yesterday you heard a little bit about the importance of that because that surface series of currents, when it reaches the Gulf Stream, dips down underneath there and comes back as a deep water current. So there's this huge, we call it a conveyor belt current, from the surface down to the depths. And that, that is hugely important in terms of controlling climate. Yesterday you heard a bit more detail, so I'm not going to go into the detail now, but you'll appreciate that that Gulf Stream downturning is beginning to weaken with climate change. And the repercussions of that are absolutely enormous. One of the immediate consequences for us in this country is that you have one, two, three major regions and biogeographically, in terms of the life that actually exists there, you will see that we've got the Namib biogeographic region, the Namaqua, the Agullis, and then swinging around onto the warm coast, we've got the Natal, a little bit of a transition in here, and then a huge area that goes all the way up 
into the Indo-West Pacific. This is hugely important because it means that South Africa has one of the greatest... Oh, oh, okay. That was great. <laughs> as long as it's the camera and not Wendy, they're stopping over. A little comic relief here, a little comic relief. Sorry, George. No problem at all. I'm used to worst interruptions. <laughs> On land, the contrasts in current have immense effects in terms of the climate. Uh, the first effect it's going to have is on the rainfall levels. And you can see shown here huge amounts of strongly seasonal rainfall taking place on the east coast. As you move across the country, less but still quite a lot. Then you get to the west coast and the rainfall is way, way down. But the other thing that happens is that the temperatures in these different places are different. When you're sitting in the middle of the country, the temperature extremes between summer and winter are enormous. That's Kimberley where my sister lives. And right now she's getting about minus two degrees C. So climate is hugely affected by the currents that exist around the coast. But it's not the only thing that is affected. Obviously, because of the rainfall patterns, productivity, the amount that you can grow in a square meter per unit time, increases from the west to the east. But when it comes to the sea, it's absolutely the opposite. The productivity in the sea is high on the west coast. And it's high for two reasons. One is that that is a cold current, but the much more important reason is that on the west coast you have winds that are swinging across the coast here and they drive away the surface waters, upwelling. And because you drive away the surface layers, then the deeper layers must upwell to replace it. Now in the depths there's no light. So the nutrients that are sitting there can never be used by plant life. There isn't the, life, the light to power the plant life, the phytoplankton. So it's only when this upwelling takes place and introduces the nutrients into the surface that you get these huge amounts of productivity kicking in on the west coast. And the consequence of that is that the major fishing grounds are to be found on the west coast and the south coast because of that upwelling. I wanted to just emphasize this point by a couple of pictures. This first picture is taken on the east coast on one of my heaven on earth places. It's a little research station which is really just a tiny little shack that sits just outside Cozy Bay on the coast there. And it's heaven on earth because there's no Wi-Fi, no cell phone connection, <laughs> no computer connection. You are there on your own and you just lap it up and love it. But in contrast to that, the West Coast is like this. It's desert. So on land you have these contrasts of productivity and these two illustrated. Uh, I couldn't resist sharing this with you. I've had some wonderful, wonderful trips with Margo all around the whole coast of Southern Africa, all the way pretty much from Angola to Mozambique. And while we were on a trip in uh, Namibia, we went to the Skeleton Coast area, which is very isolated. Very few people actually get to the north of the Skeleton Coast area. And we were wandering around on the beach, and I found this incredible toilet there. It's made out of a whale <laughs> neck bone, and I promise you, I tested it. <laughs> I promise you, it's the most comfortable toilet I have ever sat on in all my life. <laughs> but that wasn't the only really original toilet that I came across in Namibia. The other one was this one. <laughs> Woo, sorry about that. 
Margot always says, how can you put that photograph in? How can I not put it in? <laughs> but if I can tell you another secret about me, I, I was wandering around here completely on my own and I thought, there's no harm in setting myself up and putting the camera on a tripod and taking a photograph of myself here. <laughs> and so I, I posed myself there and there was my student sitting on the top of the hill looking down on this whole performance. <laughs> now let's swing back to the hard facts. One of the big consequences of this difference between the West and the East Coast is the amount of life that is supported there. What I'm showing on this diagram is moving all the way from the West through the South to the East Coast. And you can see it pretty much doesn't matter whether you're looking at algae or fish or invertebrates. There's a more or less uniform trend of increase from here to there. So on this end of the spectrum, you have huge amounts of biomass and productivity, but very low species diversity. On the other hand, on the East Coast, there isn't that amount, whoops, sorry, Whoa. There isn't that amount of biomass, but there's a huge amount of biodiversity. So I'm going to just stop here for a moment. So I don't want to just talk all the time. Can you tell me why you think it is that the East Coast has many more species than the West Coast? Sorry? Warmer temperature. Warmer temperature speeds up all the activities. <coughs> but how, why does that lead to greater biodiversity? You're correct, but why? Yeah? Um, I think it's the current. Yeah? What about the currents? The current would um, up, up well. They up well on the west coast and little on the south coast, but they don't up well on the, on the east coast. So how come there's so many species there? I heard a voice. Where did the voice come from? Actually, that's not a, not a bad suggestion, but it's not the reason because you've actually got more people on the East Coast and you've actually got more species there. What about the potential of photosynthesis? Say again? The potential of photosynthesis. The potential of photosynthesis. The West Coast photosynthesis is very much higher. Yeah? Maybe because of more presence of nutrients as compared to West Coast, that grows <coughs> up well in, and I think the difference should be in nutrients, amount of nutrients. Yeah. And what about the soil? The West Coast is more sandy. Yeah, more sandy, less nutrients off the land. More all types of yeah. Soil. Could it have anything to do with the depth of the ocean? Uh, actually, yes. I don't want to zip back, but on the East Coast, the shelf drops very quickly, so it's close to the coast. On the west coast, it's a much wider shelf. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I'm going to stop your feedback because the simple answer is scientists are still arguing about why there's this difference in the biodiversity. <laughs> the probable reason is on the west coast, there's lots of upwelling. So you'd think maybe lots of different species can live there. But that's not what happens, and for two reasons. Reason number one is there's so much productivity that a few species cash in on that and dominate the world. You know, that's where you've got the rich silver fish of the pilchards and anchovy in enormous numbers. So that's one reason. But the other reason is the West Coast is very treacherous. You get upwelling for about four or five days and then it stops. Well, now what happens when it stops? Well, that stuff drifts offshore. Now it's got no more supply of nutrients. Now it all dies. And it dies and it sinks and it uses up the oxygen. So suddenly you've got a terrible place with low oxygen and no nutrients. And you've got that for about a week. And unless the zooplankton cashes in very quickly and eats up the phytoplankton, there's a kind of break in the food chain. Huge productivity. Oh dear, no, no more, no more upwelling, no more upwelling. Die. 
And only a few things can survive the extremes. Nutrient extremes and temperature extremes. I once measured over a period of five days a difference between 4 degrees C during the peak of upwelling and 15 degrees C. So the temperature is zapping up and down. It's a tough place to live so in. The, the, the population there is balanced by interaction of uh, predation, predator yes. uh, type of yeah. activity. Good, good, okay. great. So that's the West Coast with the typical just one species, rather dull but silvery. I always like this particular photograph because there's one little fish down the bottom doing the opposite of everybody else. <laughs> which makes me feel a little bit like myself when I'm flowing against the tide of everybody else's views. But now swing across to the East Coast. When you're going to the Two Oceans Aquarium, one of the things that Margo wants you to look at there is the tropical tank and to ask yourself, okay, now we know a little bit about high diversity there, but there's also the fact that on the East Coast, these incredible color variations are present. So now I'm going to move on to the second topic that I want to deal with because although everybody looks at the fish, I'm interested in this humble pink paint-like growth on the rocks. <coughs> it's actually a seaweed even if it doesn't look like it and it's called an encrusting coralline. I want you guys to remember encrusting coralline. Encrusting, encrusting coralline. Encrusting. <laughs> Now, part of the work that I've been involved with has been concerned with encrusting corallines. And any talk of mine that didn't give credit to limpets wouldn't be worth its salt because limpets are what made my name internationally. We have some crazy limpets. One of them is the pear limpet. And if you look carefully, you'll see around each pear limpet there's a little fuzzy growth of garden which is the second fastest growing alga in the world. Kelp is the fastest. And those limpets depend entirely on those gardens. But if you look carefully, you will see that there's another halo around there where the limpet is keeping back this thick growth from conquering their gardens. I use the word gardens deliberately because they are really gardening those operations. So now I want to bring you to a big idea in science. It was developed by a guy called Bob Stenick. And he said, these thin crusts that grow on rocks are most likely to survive if the productivity is low. In other words, if light is low. Because if you get too much light, other seaweeds are simply going to overgrow them. And the other reason that these encrusting corallines might do well is if they are being grazed. Now that sounds a little strange. I mean, why should grazing help a species? It helps a species because what it's doing is it's stopping other seaweeds from overgrowing those low-growing crusts. And it stops one type of crust from overgrowing another type of crust. So I thought about this, and you guys are going to be wandering around looking at the aquarium and bits and pieces of it when you go there this afternoon. And I asked myself the question, couldn't we use the aquarium for an experiment? Well, I tried very hard to say to the guys, I want <laughs> you please to take out all the grazers and see what happens. But of course they were too interested in attracting visitors, so they weren't interested in doing that. But then I had a stroke of luck, and the stroke of luck was that one of the tanks started leaking, and they got into a big panic about this. Oh, we better take out all the fish, so they removed all the fish. And I thought, wow, this is my chance. <laughs> so I zapped along there, and it was absolutely amazing, because in the normal situation, there were little fish buzzing around, grazing on these surfaces there, and in the original condition, the encrusting coralines were the dominant thing because 
they were being grazed and kept safe from overgrowth. The foliar algae were not overgrowing. Then the fish were taken out. And within literally one week, the other seaweeds just went crazy. And these folios, upright algae, we call them macroalgae because they're large algae, completely dominated and started smothering out the thing. And then after a little bit, they sorted things out and they put the fish back and bang, things were reversed. So it was a wonderful unnatural experiment, but it taught us quite a lot. The aquarium has also discovered a whole lot of other things. One of them was the discovery of this jellyfish, which ended up being named after me. I didn't know it was being named after me. The people who named it also didn't know that I nearly died from this particular thing. I was snorkeling one day, taking underwater photographs, and one of these encountered me. <coughs> they have very long tentacles. The tentacles are about a meter long. And this thing wrapped its tentacles around my body. I was out there just, you know, and it was acutely painful. Anybody's had a blue bottle sting? How many of you had blue bottle sting? Yeah, you know it can be damn sore. This was much, much worse. And my heart started playing up. It went... <laughs> and I actually, I, I lay out there, and I, I started counting. How long is it going to be? <laughs> It was about 20 seconds and then <laughs> Anyway, I survived, but I always felt that that should have been attached to the description of this particular species. <laughs> I'm very sad to say, incidentally, that some other science uh, taxonomist has come along and decided that Charybdia branchi is no longer branchi, it's something else. Damn. <laughs> My claim to fame is gone. Discovery of new species, and not only discovery of new species, but detailed work done on the life cycles in the Two Oceans Aquarium. Jellyfish produce a larval stage that settles down, and then that little larval stage starts forming what looks like, almost like miniature <coughs> anemones, and then those miniature anemones start budding off at the top, and I'm particularly proud of this photograph because that's what these exquisite little animals look like. That's the second larval stage. Okay, for how long? Uh, they're quite short, those. Those things will then float around and they will grow and they will develop into a normal jellyfish. And it, it's about... Let me just try and remember. I think the... Sea anemone stage is, is about, uh, it lasts a long time, but it's about a week before it starts producing these ephedra larvae, as they call them. And then the ephedra larvae last about three weeks floating around, and they grow. Uh, another species was discovered by one of the volunteers at the aquarium. His name was Jason Lewis, and we ended up naming this thing and describing it and giving it a name of Lewisy in honor of this person. It's a crazy animal. It thinks it's a jellyfish, but it's changed his mind and decided, hmm, maybe I don't like swimming around anymore. And so it's turned itself upside down and it attaches itself to the substrate and is now almost like a sea anemone, or the polyp stage, as they call it. Third thing I want to talk about is what? things is are changing. Itself? Sorry? Is there any particular reason to attach itself to a substrate? How does it help? To you know, for every species, <coughs> it can change over time. And depending on what suits it better in terms of improving its fitness, leave more children, basically, will favor that particular species. So, you know, I, I can only guess why this thing changed its mind. Of course, it's not really changing its mind, it's just evolving. But maybe there were just too many jellyfish floating around competing with it, and it was 
better to be firmly anchored onto the thing. There are all sorts of possible reasons, but I don't know what the real reason is. This photograph was taken in Namibia, and it shows how the jellyfish are taking over in Namibia. There are all sorts of reasons behind this. Uh, climate change may be one of the reasons, but the most likely reason is that the fish have been depleted there by overfishing, and the fish would normally have controlled the jellyfish. But now the jellyfish are in ascendancy, they are eating the fish larvae. And so this is part of the reason for the collapse of many of the fisheries things there. The jellyfish explosion. They've calculated that there are now about 12.2 million metric tons of jellyfish present in the system. Another change that's taking place is that life is moving. As climate change drives things, you can do various things. You can die, you can adapt, or you can move. And movement is one of the things that's taken place with the pelagic fish, the anchovy and the pilchard. Originally, most of the fishing was concentrated on the west coast. But in the 2000s, they shifted to the south coast with enormous financial implications for the entire industry. Because, of course, they'd based all their canneries and their factories and so on on the west coast. And now all of a sudden, they either have to travel huge distances or they have to start moving their infrastructure. And now to complicate things, they're starting to move back again. So, it's a good question. Why? Why do they do it? Well, it seems as if this initial shift was caused by two things. Uh, the first cause was for one species was mainly simply overfishing in this area and even more so in this area here. And the animals started responding. But climate change also played a role. Now it's kind of strange, and I'm going to come back to this shortly, why they should have changed. Something else that's changed enormously is the populations of penguins. There's a lot of worry about penguin populations being close to the point of extinction. Now this photograph was taken on Dusson Island on the west coast in 1930. And I went back to exactly the same spot and that's what it looks like now. I tried to persuade Margot to come and sit on this boulder here, but she was having nothing in, so I had to have a seagull sitting there instead. <laughs> but look at this. There are virtually no penguins. There are isolated ones here or there. And the population has crashed enormously. This is what the picture looked like in about 2001, and we were feeling reasonably okay there. Because we were saying, oh, well, although the penguins declined, oh, look at that there. Now they've increased, isn't that nice? And that increase follows a lag behind the fish. The fish are declining here, but those birds are still responding to the high levels up here. But now, let's put the modern picture on it. It's incredible. Just look how this nose dive has taken place. And I've put in the, the latest picture there. And I th I'm trying to remember what percentage is. I think it's, uh, if I remember correctly, 3% of the numbers that used to be there. If I had more time, I'd bully you once again. And I'd say, OK, I'm going to make all of you the Minister of Fisheries. <coughs> and I'm going to ask you, what are you going to do about this? Because on the one hand, you have voters, and let's face it, politicians are driven by voters. You have voters who are fishers. They don't want anybody to put any halts on their fishing. On the other hand, you have a national treasure in the form of the penguins. It's a huge industry for tourism to come and see penguins. So there's another money earner there. And you must also be worried about the population crash of the birds. Um, the impact of pollution, how did that impact on their population? 
It doesn't look as if pollution has had a ma major effect on the penguins, but what has had a major effect is in the early days they used to take guano off the islands and use it as a fertilizer. And that guano is the most fantastic nesting site because you can dig into the guano there. And people used to collect the eggs as well. So that was partly responsible. But it's not responsible for what's happening now. No guano collecting now, no egg collecting now, no disturbance, and yet they're still coming down. So the main problem seems to be <coughs> fishing is in some years, please note my words, in some years, fishing is pulling the fish population down to critical levels where food availability for the birds is becoming a serious issue. When there are lots of fish, it doesn't seem to matter. All right. <coughs> Ecosystem effects of commercially important species. This is the abalone. Uh, for a long time, it was our second most important commercial species. On the lower diagram here, I'm showing you what populations used to look like. Every one of those little blobs that you're seeing there is an abalone. The densities were fantastic. And along comes overfishing and poaching. And now what you're seeing? All you're seeing is the scars where the individual animals were sitting. That's it. Oh yeah, sure, if you can, it would be nice. Thank you. Yeah, it is a little bit uh, obscure. Okay, leave it. Yeah. You'll have to squint. Sorry about that. So I had a student, Zani Zeman, come and work on those abalone to ask the question, if you take out the abalone, obviously you're hitting the abalone population, but is it having ecosystem effects as well? You know, abalone are eating seaweeds, so maybe if you take out the abalone, the seaweeds will increase. And she then designed an experiment, and the experiment, I'll show you the details of it in a moment, the experiment was one in which she left areas with abalone, and she had other plots in which she took the abalone out, and they were both fenced to keep out the abalone, or keep in the abalone, and you could then compare between those two situations. Aha! That's better. Yes. You can, sh shall I zip back? <whistles> ah, now you can see it. Okay. Except I can't see which button to press. Okay, there's your dense population. There's all that is left behind. So there's the experiment, and I, I wanted to share with you, you know, how do you cage abalone in or out? Well, what she did was she had little fences here. If you look carefully, you'll see there are spiky things <coughs> sticking up here. That's the stuff that you put on the top of roofs and ridges when you, when you want to stop birds from landing and pooing on your roof. And that little stuff has the most wonderful name. It's called Flock Off. <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't tell that to a bunch of scholars, but I can tell it to you guys. You're robust enough. <laughs> so she did this experiment, and the first result was absolutely fascinating because on this side, you're seeing all these species are present. On this side, if you take out the abalone, actually not very much different and you can do fancy statistics on that and one of those statistical programs says you know if you look at that one is very similar to that one well that one has no abalone that one has got abalone they're all mixed up in other words in other words it actually has no effect on the life that's growing on the rocks note my words on the rocks and we wondered about this because that's a lot of abalone normally, and they're eating a lot of seaweeds. And yet it's having no effect. And what we discovered was they're not eating live seaweeds. They're sitting around, lifting up their shells, and they're waiting 
for drift pieces of particularly kelp to move under them and then they snap down on it and they feed on those drift, obviously dead and dying, seaweeds. So if you're feeding on dead or dying seaweeds, you don't have any effect on the living ones on the rock. So we're a little bit disappointed in a way with that. I know scientists are not meant to be disappointed, but we are. But then she asked a different question. She asked the question whether the ecosystems that are developing on the rocks versus those that are growing on the shells, whether those are different. And now you can see, yes, they are absolutely different. So although they're not controlling the seaweeds, they are having an ecosystem effect in creating a habitat that is unique for a whole lot of different species. The last thing I want to deal with refers back to the climate change question, and that is lobsters and what ecosystem effects they have. Because, of course, we are pulling out huge amounts of lobster. I can tell you that lobster is now about 2.1% of what it used to be before fishing started. Now, one interesting thing that one of my students discovered was that originally lobster were concentrated on the west coast, but they've moved. They've moved down onto the south coast. And again, I wish I had time to bully you guys to say, what on earth are they move, doing moving onto the, onto the south coast? I'll give you the answer. No, maybe I won't. Maybe I'll believe you after all. <laughs> what is your immediate image when you think about climate change? Warm water. Warm water. Warm water. Global warming. Now, th that sounds immediately a little odd because if the water's warming up, how come a cold water West Coast species is moving down on the south where the temperatures are warmer? And the answer to that is global warming is not universal. Global warming depends on all sorts of things. And one of the things it depends on is winds. With global warming, the wind belts are moving southwards. And so in the south, we're now getting much more upwelling than we used to get. And the waters there are actually getting colder, whereas those further north are actually getting warmer. So the lobsters are partly, at least, responding to this climate change. And with that response comes massive ecosystem effects. Those lobsters eat all sorts of things, but they particularly eat grazers and herbivores. They eat urchins, they eat uh, ollicrocs, they eat periwinkles, they eat limpets. And I'm showing you here a picture of, of one of the ollicrocs. And all of those grazers have decreased in number hugely as a result of these lobsters moving into this area. <coughs> in the words of the immortal song, bye-bye happiness. <laughs> Urchins also getting nailed, and urchins are hugely important for several reasons. Reason number one is that these urchins are where juvenile abalone, around about the size of maybe 10 millimeters or so, they hide underneath these urchins where they get protection and they get a free food supply from what the urchins are catching. So it's a cool place for juveniles to live in. But let's go into this in a little bit more detail. Remember the encrusting corallines? <coughs> now, encrusting corallines are not just pretty looking pink paint on rocks. Encrusting corallines are where the very tiny recruits, the larval stages of the abalone, settle. You can see a whole bunch of them settling here and turning into the first baby recruit stage. So you've got urchins and you've got encrusting corallines being vital for the survival of the population of those things. Bye-bye, sweet caress. 
you're losing habitats or potentially losing habitats that are vital for the population of the abalone. Uh, this is what those juveniles look like. I cheated a bit here. This was from, a, from an agriculture farm. And it's quite an interesting picture because if you look here, you can see how the color changes. Uh, to begin with, they're feeding on diatoms and microscopic algae. And then they give them a, a diet of kelp and they change color accordingly. I think we're going to die. <laughs> So to end up, I want to show you some of the complications and bring you back to the aquarium again. Uh, one of my students, by the way, I, I, I love my students. They were my lifeblood in, in research. One of my students did an experiment at the Two Oceans Aquarium in which she put lobsters into fish tanks and she either kept the lobsters tethered in the open so that they could walk around and feed and so on, but they couldn't hide, or she left them free to hide. And only if they were able to hide in shelters did they survive. There you can see the survival rate if they're able to hide versus 20 minutes it took the fish to eliminate any lobster that couldn't hide. <coughs> However, if you look in nature, those fish populations are depleted by overfishing. Again, we come to a topic that's very much part of your curriculum, thinking about how you manage resources. Another student. Margot always teases me that most of my students are gorgeous and female. <laughs> <laughs> what she did was to ask the question, if we had not overfished the fish, would that have stopped the lobsters from invading and having the consequences that they have had? She had to do this with mathematical models because obviously it was difficult to do a real life experiment. Whoa. Hello? Nice one. Oh. <laughs> okay. So in her model, what she asked the question was, if you had or did not have these large predatory fishes in nature, what would happen? And you can see here, first question, what about, whee, my trigger finger is going too fast. First question was, what would happen to the urchins? Well, if you'd had fish present, they would have controlled the lobsters to the extent that the urchins might have taken a dip, but they would have been relatively little affected. <coughs> that tells us that the effect of those fish is to help the abalone by keeping the urchins there. Now, what about the abalone themselves? Well, the abalone don't do quite so well, but they still do better if there are those big fish present. So the difference between those two lines is telling you the difference between having fish or not having large predatory fish. I'm putting the whole story together here and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I want you to register two things from this diagram. The first thing I want you to register is just how complex ecosystems are. And this is something very difficult for fisheries managers to manage. I've spoken a little bit about the fact that Urchins will provide a hidey hole for recruits, but urchins also keep the substrate clean, which helps the crustose algae. And grazers like that also control other seaweeds, which allows the crustose corallines to co-occur. Every one of these steps was worked out by students of mine in actual experiments to verify that this is not just some scientific whim. So, lobsters, yes or no? Well, you've seen that when lobsters are present, when they invade like they did there, they're going to have big effects in preying on the grazers. And then if you added the next level and said, but hang on a second, what about the big fish? 
if you'd not overfished those big fish, those big fish would have controlled the lobsters. And you can see how this whole web nicely fits together. <coughs> I'm going to end scientifically on that, but I'll share one last secret with you. I was at a very highfalutin conference in uh, New Zealand, and at that conference they were making all sorts of very fancy presentations, the gold medal of this and that, and the silver medal of this and that, <coughs> etc. And the students decided I needed a presentation. And so they ran off and they found this lovely bucket, which is still a rubbish bin in my office. And they said, we want George to have a special present, curious George. And I show you t this for two reasons. First of all, first reason, curiosity is still to me the absolute key of science. And curiosity should be the key of teaching. And curiosity should be the key to learning. But I also share this because I don't know how many of you know what Curious George is, because it was a joke against me. <laughs> Curious George is the ape. <laughs> so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Maybe we do need some lights now. <laughs>